All right, here we go. Probably my favorite chapter in the book we're going to continue with. Chapter 8, Confidence Intervals. Partly because it's easy, but partly because it just makes sense. We don't know what the true proportion is in these situations. We have to find it. So that's what we're going to do. So 8.1, it says confidence intervals, the basics. Point estimer, estimator, and point estimate. So that's what we're talking about when we're making a confidence interval. We just talked about it with the tacos, the the our little P hat, what you stand in the middle with, that's going to be your point estimator. And then you move out by a random, by a, not a random, by a margin of error. Okay. So a point estimator is a statistic that provides an estimate of the population parameter. It's what we get from our samples. The value of that statistic, statistic from a sample, remember we talked about that, is called a point estimate. Ideally, a point estimate is our best guess at the value. Okay, so we're doing the tacos, you sample 25 people and you found that 35% of people like tacos. That's your point estimate. That's your best guess at what's going on. Okay, so it says, in each of the following settings, determine the point estimator you would use and calculate the value of the point estimate. So part A says the makers of a new golf ball want to estimate the median distance, the median distance um, the new balls will travel when hit by a mechanical driver. They select a random sample of 10 balls and measure the distance each ball travels after being hit by the mechanical driver. Here are the distances. So they give you all those distances. What's the point estimator there? What do we want to use as the point estimator? What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the median distance. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is part A, we're going to find the median. Find the median of the sample. Okay. So we'd have to put all those numbers into order. So let's look at what the smallest one is. It looks like that's my smallest. That's one. Do I have any 283s? No. I have two 284s. Okay. And then um, it looks like I've got 285. So that's one, two, three. So this would be four and four. So one, two, three, four. So let me just do it this way. I'm probably confusing you more than anything right there. So 282 is our smallest. And then we have two 284s. 284, 284. So I'm going to just cross those out. 284, 284, 282. Then I've got a 285 and another 285 and another 285. 285, 285, 285. Um, a 286, a 287, a 288, a 290, 1234567899. We don't find the median in the middle. 1234567899. So it comes in here. Well, guess what? That's going to be 285. So our Sample median, sample median is what we're using. Sample median, median of the sample, 285. Okay? Part B. The golf ball manufacturer would also like to investigate the variability of the distance traveled by the golf balls by estimating the interquartile range. So the IQR is going to be our point estimator. Okay? That's our point estimator. Or point estimate. Okay, so let's find out what the IQR is. Well, we've got to find the median of this side, right? So that's going to be my first quartile, and the, then I've got my third quartile. So the IQR is going to be 287 minus 284, so that's going to be three yards. Okay, so I use the IQR as my point estimator, and that's three yards. Part C says the math department wants to know what proportion of its students own a graphing calculator. So they take a random sample of 100 students and find that 28 own a graphing calculator. So our p hat is 0.28. What's our best guess? What's our point estimate? 0.28. Why? It's what we got from our sample. It's our statistic from our sample. Okay. So now we get into this next part where it says um, the idea of a confidence interval. Confidence interval for a parameter is two parts. An interval calculated from the data, which has the form estimate, which we've been using as p hat so far, but it could be an x bar. 
and then it's plus or minus the margin of error, plus or minus the margin of error. And you can write that right in here if you wanted to. The margin of error tells us how close the estimate tends to be to the unknown parameter in repeated setting. Confidence interval C, which gives the overall success rate for the method calculating the confidence interval. That is, C percent of all possible samples, the method would yield an interval that captures the true parameter value. The most common confidence interval is 95 percent. So this next part's really important, okay, it's really, really important interpreting confidence levels and confidence intervals. And my suggestion to you would be to memorize these things so you know the difference between them. They are going to ask you, and you need to know the difference. If they want you to interpret a confidence interval, it's different than interpreting a confidence level. Okay? The confidence level is the overall capture rate if the method is used many times. To say that X bar plus or minus 10 is a 95% confidence interval for the population mean mu is to say that in repeated samples, 95% of these intervals capture mu. So confidence level, to say we are 95% confident is shorthand for 95% of all samples of a given size. So if they say in that problem it's size 10, um, like we did, ooh, let's go back, let's go back. 95% of all samples of uh, size 100. Okay, You have to use the sample size for this population will result in an interval that captures the unknown parameter. That's confidence level. Not as common as the confidence interval. Confidence interval, we say we're 95% confident. Okay, the interval from 0.25 to 0.85 captures the actual value of the population parameter in context, okay? Two different things that work there. Two different things that work, okay? And you have to know the difference. And you say, well, how can I tell the difference? Memorize it. I'm telling you right now. Memorize it and you're going to be fine. That's, that's kind of what you have to do. There's, I don't have any other tips for you for that, okay? So it says interpret the confidence interval. So interval, and I say easy, and level is the other one. Easy, that's taking the two parentheses and just talking about being 95% confident, okay? So for this one, my interval is 0.44 plus or minus 0 0.03, okay? So if I go up, if I want a 95% confidence interval, I've got to go plus or minus two of those standard deviations, okay? So let's, well, if, they give, if they, they've done this, this represents two standard deviations, okay? So if I go up 0.03, it's going to be 0.47, and this is going to be 0.41. So if I want to interpret the confidence interval, okay, I'm going to write this out for you. You're going to say something like, we are 95% confident that the true proportion, now what does this mean, Barack, jo Barack Obama's approval rating, we are 95% confident that the true proportion of people who approve of Obama's job, approval of job performance, I guess, job performance, is captured in the interval from 0 0.41 to 0 0.47, okay? Something like that, okay? That captures the true proportion of people who believe Obama is doing a good job. We're 95% confident the true proportion of people who approve of job, Obama's job performance has captured the interval from 0.41 to 0.47. That is the interval. I say easy because that one's easier for me. The other one's a little bit more awkward. The other one's something you almost have to memorize, the confidence level. Okay. Now, let's look back for confidence level. 95% confident of all possible samples of a given size, okay? So it started off the same way. We, or oh, not even we, that's more we, in 95%, okay, of 
all possible samples, word for word, 95% confident, 95% of all possible samples, okay, of a given size, what's our, what's our, do we have a given size for this one? I don't know that it really says really what it is. Um, so we'd say 95% of all possible samples of a given size, okay, what's it say next? will result in an interval that captures the unknown parameter. So 95% of all possible samples, okay, of a given size or of the same size, that may be better, because they didn't give us one. Usually they'll give you one. They'll give you, say, size, what your sample size is. 95% of all possible samples of the same size, the resulting confidence interval would capture the true proportion of people who approve of Obama's job performance. Okay? So they're a little bit different there. Okay? They're a little bit different. So, I want you guys to go to the CYU on page 476. Please pause the video and do the CYU on page 476. And then we'll talk about it. The only way you can get better at these is by actually doing examples. You do examples, that's how you get better at it. Okay, so hopefully you're back. Um, we're talking about a random sample of size 10 here. Okay, so it says N equals 10, brand X hot dogs. Can only imagine how good those are. Brand X hot dogs. A 95% CI is, for the standard deviation, okay, put 95% CI for the standard deviation is 2.84 to 7.55, okay? So let's do the easy one first. The easy one is to do the interval. We are 95% confident that the true proportion Okay. True proportion of standard deviation of fat content. No one has, no one wants to hear about fat content when you're eating a hot dog. But we are 95% confident that the true proportion of standard deviation of fat content is captured in the interval from 2.84 to 7.55. Okay, that's your interval. 95% confident the true proportion of the standard deviation of fat content is captured in the interval that they gave us. Now let's talk about the level. In 95% of all possible samples, that's memorization, of size what? They tell us, they tell us the size, okay? Of size 10, 95% of all possibles of size 10, brand X hot dogs, okay? The Resulting confidence interval would capture the true standard deviation. So a 95% of all possible samples of size 10, okay, 
brand X hot dogs, the resulting confidence interval would capture the true standard deviation. So there's interval, there's level. My tips, memorize. Okay, that's my tips, memorize. True or false? The interval has a 95% chance of containing. No, no. It either is in the interval or it's not. That's not the correct standard, that's not the correct interpretation. C is no, not the correct interpretation of that. Okay, so the next part here, the next part. Constructing a confidence interval. We've already talked about this in, some, in the other video. Okay? Statistic. Either a p-hat or an x-bar. Plus or minus the critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic. And we've talked about formulas for that as well. Where the statistic is we use is the point estimator. So either a p-hat or an x-bar. p-hat will be 8.2, x-bar will be 8.3. We would like high confidence, it tells us that we're getting correct answers, and a small margin of error, which says that we've, we, we've located that parameter precisely. The margin of error depends on the critical value and the standard deviation of the statistic. Okay? Margin of error gets smaller. Star this, circle this, do something here. Okay? Margin of error gets smaller. Confidence level decreases. Sample size increases. These two uh, work opposite of each other. Okay, sample size larger, your um, standard deviation is smaller, and your confidence interval is narrower. It's more precise. Okay, so here are our conditions. Here are our conditions that we have to go through. Okay, and I'm going to give you a sheet to copy in a second, and I'm going to leave it up there. And it has the reasons for these because sometimes they'll ask you, why do we have this condition? Okay, so when we do our four-step process, four-step process, we do state, plan, do, and conclude. Okay, we're going to learn this in 8.2. Okay, it's a little preview. The conditions are included in your plan step. Okay, random, normal, independent. Random, normal, independent. And then you also have to quote name your test which we will be talking about in this case naming your interval you're doing a confidence interval for proportions or a confidence interval for sample means and we'll talk about that in eight too okay but this is where the conditions come in state we're going to state what we do plan we're going to check our conditions and name our test do our, is all the math for finding your p hat and then plus or minus that margin of error where it's your critical z times your standard deviation okay that's the do and then the conclude is a statement about it so i've got a better sheet than than what they have there for this okay so these are conditions for inference okay and i want you guys to put this into your notes because i'm telling you now it's going to be huge this is going to be very important. It's going to be helpful to you. So, these conditions for inference, okay, they have to do with everything comes back to shape, center, and spread. Okay, everything comes back to this. Shape, that's the normal condition. We have the random, we have the normal, and we have independent as our three conditions. Normal, that's shape. Random has to do with getting a good center, okay? Making sure our stuff is not biased. And then independent has to do with spread and our standard deviation. So let's go through it piece by piece and I want to make sure you have this in your notes. Put it at the top, conditions for inference. We're going to talk about this in chapter 8. We're going to talk about this in chapter 9. We're going to talk about this in chapter 10. So it's really important, okay? R, random. Okay, I'm going to say R, N, I for these. Random, normal, independent. R, random. It will usually state it's from a random sample. This is the easiest of the conditions to satisfy. You would say something like, it states that the samples were collected randomly. Why? Why is this important? So this is what we do. This is what you will have in your four-step process. These are questions about why. They might say, why do we have that? Why do we have that condition? These are the reasons for it. 
These might be quiz and test questions, so I would look at it. Why is it important? Random samples give us unbiased data from a sample. 